Hi, everybody. Stefan Molyneux from Freedom Main Radio, back with a good friend, Dr. Duke Pastor, a tenured university professor, which is the only reason he can appear on this show. Author and the academic director of Freedom Project Academy, a live online school offering individual classes and a complete curricula for students in kindergarten through high school. And you can check out Dr. Duke's work at the Freedom Project Academy at fpeusa.org. Dr. Pester, how are you doing today? We're going to go and uh, examine some Saracens uh, th this afternoon. Excellent. This is a topic dear to my heart because as a professor at a university, uh, this particular issue is used by students across the board, the, the miseducated students, to completely write off 2,000 years of history, literature, culture, and art. Whenever any serious discussion is endeavored about Christian history, Western history, uh, the Crusades, it's almost like a mantra that shuts down discourse. It's almost like the word racist. Once it's said, everybody's got to stop and no longer think. Soon they'll be using that word slavery as well in the same context. So let us uh, start with the let's start with the mythology or start with the generally accepted wisdom regarding the Crusades. What is it that your students are coming into your class uh, believing about it? Well, in the first place, they know nothing about the Crusades. Um, I gave a series of quizzes over about five years to my kids uh, to find out general knowledge. And one of the questions I would ask them is, uh, date the Crusades. When did the Crusades occur? And literally, uh, in five years worth of quizzes, about 600 quizzes that I had, about 87% of kids could not identify within 500 years when the, the Crusades took place. So they know nothing about them. They don't even know who the, who the enemy was when the Crusades were being war, uh, uh, waged. Uh, very few of them could list the Ottoman Empire or Islam, uh, the caliphates, very few knew that. Uh, they just knew in their little programmed minds that the Crusades were a synonym for Christian violence, they were a synonym for uh, Western imperialism, they were a synonym for uh, everything evil uh, in multicultural discourse, right? The multicultural argument that uh, all cultures are e equal, ignore your senses, ignore history, ignore the way cultures treat their own people, they're all the same, and if that's so, that means Western culture, and America in particular, has to be wicked. The only reason we have greater technology, greater superiority militarily, greater wealth, is because we must have raped and stolen uh, and dominated other cultures to get it. So the Crusades is, the word crusade, is one really powerful word that sums up everything from what happened to the Native Americans to everything that happened with the Romans, uh, everything in between, and, and particularly what happened in Christian culture. So they know nothing about it, uh, except the political spin that they're given by their teachers. Well, and this is the same thing happens with slavery as well. The Christian West was involved in the slave trade and in the practice of slavery post-Roman Empire for the shortest amount of time of relative to Jewish cultures or, or Islamic cultures. And of course, it was the Christian European West, uh, white males, the, the <laughs> Satans of history, who actually ended the practice of slavery, not just in the West, not just in Europe, but worldwide through the agency of the British Empire and the power of the British Navy. So, uh, you know, white males involved in slavery for the least amount of time, found it morally abhorrent, ended slavery worldwide, and now who's the only group ever blamed <laughs> for slavery? It is, it, it, it is one of these horrible things in history that no good deed goes unpunished. And lo, one must be aware when one sets out upon the journey to sail around the world, will, you will be shot at for all of the good things that you do. And if you do bad things, well, you're considered dangerous. So people will cover up and protect everything that you've done. It is, you know, one of the trials and tribulations that occurs in the lives of good people and uh, decent cultures. So yeah, th this idea that it was just some random imperialistic slaughter fest in the Middle East, uh, you know, Christians just woke up one morning and said, hey, let's go and, um, you know, behead some people uh, far overseas. This is... Um, it's criminal, literally it's criminal intellectual dishonesty, because uh, let's, let's start with the basics. Of course, Christianity, originally a Middle Eastern uh, religion. And if you look at the Middle East now, not a whole lot of Christians left. And that should be the first clue that what you're being told might not be 100% true. Yeah, and to pre preface what I'm about to say, uh, you want to see a progressive's head explode? Point out to them 
that the first what I great live for. <laughs> point out to them that the first great slave holding nation in the history of the of the world was a African society, right? Egypt. Let them know that. All this uh, black Athena stuff that we got in the 70s, the idea that uh, Greek culture and Egyptian culture was primarily a black culture stolen by white people as a way of sort of legitimizing uh, cultures prior to Western culture as being legitimate cultures that were run by black people. Fine. I'm willing to give you Egypt, even though, of course, we know uh, Northern e uh, Africa is much different than Southern Africa. Let's give uh, these progressives Egypt because welcome to the club. You were the first great slaveholding people in the history of the world. Uh, Africa then. And if you want to argue that Africans were black people, I don't think it's true, but if you want to make that argument, uh, then you, African Americans, if you would want to call it that, in this country have to recognize that slavery first started with them. Oh, but there's, we'll never there's, get slaves, there's open air slave markets now in Libya. They, they've emerged in Libya. Some of the migrants are being snatched up. The women are being raped and sold. Is, and where, where are all the people who are anti-slavery? No, no, no. The important thing is what happened among four or five percent of whites uh, and a lot of blacks, slave owners in America, 150 years ago. That's the only, only important thing uh, about slavery. The fact that it's currently going on in Libya uh, apparently doesn't matter because you can't guilt Libyans into giving you money. So, okay, <laughs> let's, and we'll come back to slavery because, uh, uh, you know, historical Islam and slavery is uh, something that is a little bit um, under, uh, under examined. So, so before the Islamic conquests began, and we're talking, of course, uh, you know, Islam developed in the Middle East in the early 7th century. We're going back, back, baby, you know, 1300, 1400 years. So 622, Islam begins to develop and conquers most of the Middle East and North Africa within 80 years. Now, this is a big thing. Before Islam, the Middle East, you know, there's, there's Christians, there's Z uh, Jews, Zoroastrians, Arab polytheists, and uh, Greco-Roman civilization, and, and so on. So it was a multicultural mosaic, you know, multiculturalism can be a good thing, multicultural mosaic, and then Islam came along and was initially somewhat peaceful, tried to convert by the word rather than the sword, and then seemed to, um, well, not stay the course, so to speak, and became fairly aggressively expansionist. Right. In the middle of the seventh century, like you said, uh, 600 plus years after uh, Christ, you have Muhammad, who looks around the world surrounding him, and he sees primarily Jewish and Christian peoples. And so what Muhammad does is he takes a lot from the Old Testament, takes a lot from the New Testament, takes a little bit from the old Persian mythologies, and creates a religion that centers him as the prophet. Uh, and within his lifetime, before he was even dead, uh, the warmongering, the, the colonial ambitions of Islam had really come to dominate. People who want to talk about the Crusades, and we're talking about the 10th and 11th and 12th centuries, we're talking here as early as the 8th century, as early as 732 AD, uh, within 100 years of, of the founding of Islam, you have the famous Battle of Tours where Islamic armies, the Umayyad Caliphate, people don't know this, the Umayyad Caliphate was the fifth largest empire in the history of the world. Within a hundred years of, of, of Muhammad's birth, you had the fifth largest empire ever to, to walk the earth, had conquered Spain, was turned uh, all of the northern African coasts, had conquered much of what we call Syria and Palestine today. Sicily, and was, for almost 300 Sicily. years. Sicily, they ran, uh, the Muslims ran a caliphate in Sicily for almost 300 years. Absolutely. And so within 100 years, by 732 AD, Spain had been conquered, and Islam was uh, uh, trying to take France. And so that's when you have the famous uh, battle of Tours led by Charles Martel, right? Our English history, our, our European history reminds us, Charles Martel in Latin, the word means Charles the Hammer. And what he did is he systematically pushed the, uh, the in Islamic invaders out of France. So in other words, for about 400 years before there was a single European crusade to the Holy Land, you had all of the major battles between Islam and Christianity fought on Christian territory by a, a encroaching Islamic armies that were not the least interested in peace or coexistence. It took four centuries for Europeans to take the battle to Jerusalem. Let that sink in for a second. It was a 400 year war before a single battle was fought on Islamic territory. And that tells us something, right? That it's not that the Europeans were being reactionary or they were sending crusader armies simply for loot and plunder. This was an existential struggle for the survival of Europe. It wasn't Europeans trying to conquer Islamic territory. It was exactly the opposite. Well, it's like, getting someone out of your home who's a home invader and suddenly you're the aggressor. So, yeah, let's just remember this. The first Muslim empire, right, the Rashidun Caliphate, 9 million square miles at its, at its height. That's about the same size as modern-day uh, America. The second, as you pointed out, the Umayyad Caliphate, uh, 
one and a half times larger. That's 15 million square kilometers, which is close to the size of modern day Russia. And if you want to compare that, you know, the Roman Empire, remember how bad and colonialistic and imperialistic the Roman Empire was, the model for the <laughs> Star Destroyer these days, it seems. So the Roman Empire, after 800 years in its prime, 5 million square kilometers, one third the size of the largest, the second Muslim empire. And it took 800 years, second Muslim empire, what about 100 years or so. So very expansionistic, very aggressive, and very uh, it very thoroughly subjugated uh, Christians or non-Muslims within its uh, borders, right? You had uh, Christian ta heavy taxes, 20%, which was enormous back in the day, imposed upon Christians. A lot of people had to convert or face uh, true financial ruin. Uh, and there was a lot of this convert or die stuff that went on back in the day, uh, and uh, it did not spread necessarily by the force of its arguments or the persuasiveness of its theology. And so when this sudden, a very brutal and expansionistic ideology has emerged and is spreading across the known world at the time, then when, when the Christians decide to fight back and retake their lands, uh, suddenly they are the aggressors. I mean, it's almost like, it's almost like uh, the, the, um, the non-Christians have been in charge of uh, historical teachings. Yeah, I agree 100%. And let's, let's be very clear. I, I don't like to look back at history, especially history a thousand years old, and try to pick moral winners and losers in the sense that we must recognize that the Europeans weren't doing nothing when, when Islam came along. They were warring amongst themselves, right? You had Christian uh, emerging Christian nation states warring with other Christian nation states and with pagan nation states. So uh, the idea that somehow uh, we go back now to history, whether it's 100 years ago or 200 years ago to the Founding Fathers or 1,000 years ago to the Crusades, and what we're doing is we're projecting our liberal values back on history. What we don't like today, what we in our enlightened benevolences have come to reject that has to be the filter, the only filter through which we see history. So to be good historians, I think what we need to do is recognize that everybody, there was not a culture in the whole wide world that was not militaristic. There were no peaceable cultures. You could you could cite various sects, for instance, of Christianity or, or, or Buddhism uh, that eschewed violence, but they were part of a larger movement that was protected by military might. Uh, certainly with Christianity, that was true. Judaism, it was true. All the major religions. So war was the norm. Conquering territory was the norm. We recognize that now as a bad thing, but for them, they didn't. Uh, so judging them first and foremost, whether it's just judging the Islamic crusaders or judging the, the European crusaders, uh, simply by the politically correct lens of war is bad, John and Yoko, let's all sit around and sing Kumbaya, judging history by that lens, this is what the Soviets did, the, uh, the Marxist dialectic in history. Re Rewrite history so it's favorable to your political cause, revisionist history. Having said that, you go back to the, to the actual uh, combat, the actual uh, wars in, uh, from the creation of Islam in the seventh century all the way through about, really it wasn't until about 1500, 1571, if you want to talk about the Battle of Lepanto, which really finally once and for all pushed uh, Islam back, uh, the Ottoman Empire back to Asia more or less. Uh, we're talking about 700 years of almost continual war, most of which time uh, Europe was spent as uh, on the, uh, the, the, the victim side. Europe was being invaded, European ships were being harassed uh, by sea and by land, and people don't recognize. When I ask my kids about Dracula, right, it's all goofy horror stuff, but they have no idea of the Battle of Turgoviste, right? Uh, how how Vlad, Vlad II of Wallachia, how he became Count Dracula, right? And Vlad the Impaler. But impaling, simply taking your enemies and spitting them on long, tall spears so that they would bloodily ooze down the spear and die a horrible death. It's interesting, right? Vlad has been given the, he was the, the Wallachian prince who fought back the Ottoman invaders to Transylvania, to Eastern Europe. Uh, he's called that, the impaler, simply because he did what the Muslims were doing. Impaling was a Muslim form of punishment. When Muslim armies conquered Christians, they impaled them, man, woman, and child. Uh, they, they pierced them with spears. They let them writhe on those spears till they died. And so all Vlad did was when he finally defeated the encroaching Muslims is he gave them a taste of their own medicine. And so forever on in history, again, he's the impaler, and there's no mention of the barbarity and cruelty of the Turkish attackers.
Well, this is the important thing to remember that for the past 50 years, maybe a little bit longer, it has been a relentless hostility coming out of academia and the media and, and Hollywood and just about everything that is uh, culturally available as a weapon against traditional Western values, Christian values, uh, free market values, and so on. Because, of course, the story of colonialism is that only white Europeans practiced it, and they brutalized third world countries who were entirely justified and right in throwing off the shackles of Western colonialism and imperialism. However, when Europe gets colonized by Islam uh, in the past, well, it's really, really bad, you see, for Europeans and Christians to fight back and throw off the shackles of Islamic uh, imperialism. Although I think it could be safely said that if you wanted to live under an imperialistic power, you probably wanted to choose 19th century England rather than, say, 9th century Islam. So this is just something to remember. There's this prejudice, there's this bigotry, to some degree racism, anti-Western, anti-Christian, anti-freedom um, cancer really running through the narratives of history that have uh, evolved over the past half century. Yeah, we hear about the evils of British colonialism all the time. This is the bias you're talking about. And yet, as bad as the British were, uh, think about the entire uh, Hindu custom of the untouchable, right? For about a thousand years, an entire class, like oh, the overwhelming majority of the population of, of India was considered uh, untouchable. You couldn't touch them. They were diseased, right? Uh, they were left in squalor and poverty and misery. Whatever you say about the British, uh, they ended a lot of that stuff. And this is the other thing. You know, it drives them nuts when you point out that if we recognize, and, and you have to recognize this, because this is how the left wins these arguments, by cutting us off from the totality of history. Let's just focus on the evils of the West, the evils of the white male, the evils of the British or the Christian or the American soldier versus the Indian. That's how they do it. If you understand, if we understand and accept the premise that colonialism, genocide, oppression, tyranny, these were aspects of almost every single human culture that's ever been around. We accept that historically unalterably true premise. Then it makes their heads explode when you point out, so they're really mad progressives that the West just did what everybody else was doing better, right? <laughs> they Not only did they invent better, not only did they create better, they, co they conquered better, right? Let's just admit that. And if you admit that, uh, I love what Dinesh D'Souza, right, who was uh, obviously born in India, uh, Indian parentage, he has a wonderful article he wrote a few years back. It's called Two Cheers for Colonialism. It, I can't quite go three, D'Souza says, because of course there were oppression. Of course there was tyranny. But how much better off am I is the Indian continent, for instance, because uh, that the, the British, for all of their um, uh, methodical ways and, and their occasional brutality, were much, much better conquerors, much, much better rulers. Uh, you couldn't have had Gandhi in the old uh, Indian system, right? But you could have had him in British those British law schools that he went to as a colonialist who visited England, right? So that has to be acknowledged as well. There is a direct uh, statistical correlation between a history of British colonial rule and present-day economic and political freedoms, as well as uh, higher standards of living. Uh, you can, one way you know in which a... a um, uh, a sort of colonial occupation is somewhat benevolent is just look at the birth rates. Look at the total population of the country. If the population of the country is going up, it's not that bad. If you look at, you know, the history uh, prior to Islamic conquest, just look at North Africa. North Africa used to be Christian. I mean, this, it was the home of, of St. Augustine and, and St. Felicity, Perpetua, the, 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 the martyrs and so on. Uh, it, it was central, North Africa, central to the development of Christian tradition and, and thought. And within one generation after the Prophet's death, it had fallen to Islam. And uh, there used to be, in, it used to be an entire Christian civilization, North Africa. How many are left? Where, where did they go? What happened? Their population certainly didn't increase under the, their new colonial rulers. Well, Rome, a lot of people don't recognize, Ro uh, Northern Africa provided a number of Rome's emperors. And a, 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 a surprisingly significant number of Roman emperors actually were born in Northern Africa. Uh, and so the idea, 
perfectly in the heart of Western culture. And yeah, I think that's exactly right, that we, the progressive way of looking at history now, and you can see it in American history school books with the, I call it the Howard Zinnification of American history. Howard Zinn was a, a, a radical Marxist historian in the 1970s and 80s who created a people's history of the United States, which was focused exclusively on uh, lower class Marxist arguments, right? Forget the achievers, forget civilization, forget military history. Let's talk about who loses in Western culture, who loses because of capitalism and free markets. Our kids for about 40 years in American schools have been learning the Marxist Zinn version of history. And in that view of history, things like socialism, Islam, uh, non-Western empires, non-Western slavery, that's all whitewashed, right, to magnify America's sin. My students are absolutely staggered when I point out to them that Indian tribes, Native American tribes like the Cheyenne and the Comanche actually had black slaves and in some instances had African slaves beyond the Civil War when after the Emancipation Proclamation. It's a staggering thing for them to have to comprehend and no one's ever pointed it out to them before. Well, I mean, the native, the indigenous population in America, I mean, they, they've found torture pits with 500 skeletons brutally uh, tortured to death. Uh, yeah, they owned and collected slaves, which brutal war against each other. You know, it's back to this. We, we should do another show on the Rousseauian noble savage myth, but uh, we'll do that another time. But no, they were, you know, Stone Age and, and as brutal as one uh, can imagine. So, so this is important, right? There were five major Christian capitals in the Middle East. And by the end of the seventh century, three of those five had been taken over by, by Muslims. Constantinople, besieged twice by Muslims. Uh, uh, Rome was attacked and its holy shrines were, were pillaged. And so this encroachment, this attack, this, this, this tide of brutality coming out of the Muslim world in the, um, at the end of the seventh century was alarming and was a, a constant focus of Christian thought. How are we going to defend ourselves against this violent and expansionistic uh, belief system? Yeah, and you know the the the, comp the consequences of this way of arguing of of I found myself in university context being labeled a racist simply for trying to point out these broader truths of history. This is not about Muslims. Muslims are, you know, Muslims today are under siege by Western culture. If, if uh, warmongering presidents didn't treat Islam so bad, we would have never had 9-11. It's this absolute unwillingness to go back and look at the historical origins of all these conflicts. Uh, you mentioned at the beginning of our talk, uh, there are almost no Christians in the Middle East whatsoever, right? What you do have is the one Jewish state of Israel, surrounded by about 2 billion Muslims, uh, a state of about 6 million people, surrounded by 2 billion Muslims. It's the only democracy in the entire area. And the, uh, the entire world narrative is, is that it's an illegitimate state that must be eradicated uh, it, because somehow that one little entity is, is oppressing Muslims worldwide. It, it's, it's, it's that same argument applied back to the Crusades. We're going to magnify the sins of one group uh, so reprehensibly and completely ignore uh, how the rest of uh, the, the so-called oppressed power is being treated. Right. And so the news of Christian suffering under the Muslim rulers, of course, we've got to remember it was uh, far, far from the age of TCPIP. And so news traveled slowly. And in particular, around the late 10th and early 11th century, uh, uh, there was a Muslim emperor ordered the persecution and forced conversion of many Christians in his uh, empire. And they destroyed the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, Sepulchre sorry, in Jerusalem, the most revered church in the Christian world. And so once this church had been uh, destroyed, and of course, you know, think of, of Islam sensitive to how the Quran uh, is treated. Well, this is the most holy uh, church in, in Christendom, destroyed and, and the um, forced conversions of Christians and so on. And of course, pilgrims wanted to go to the Holy Land, um, as similar to the, the Mecca journey. And so it did actually reach uh, the Christian West, like Europe, where, of course, Europe had spread, uh, sorry, Christianity had spread into Europe faster in some ways because it was being driven out of the Middle East. You know, the refugees that we see now that are coming across the Mediterranean into Europe, of which only 2% are Syrian war refugees, but that's a topic for another time. The fleeing the war, the Christians moved into uh, Europe partly because they were being driven out of the Middle East by uh, by Muslim uh, conquests. And so there was this idea of where does this stop? Wh where do we stop and, and draw the line 
and begin to fight back. Now, it did, of course, happen when the Muslims had come uh, very, very far into Europe, as you point out. I mean, central uh, Italy and, and Sicily and Spain, and, and they're starting into France. Bulgaria, it took over 1,100 years to free Bulgaria from Muslim rule. So that is a long time, frankly, even in historical standards, that's a long time. And so there was this sense is if we don't stop it now, we can't live in the ocean and that's where we're going to end up. It's a great point. You mentioned how fleeing Christians, Christians fleeing from Islamic ty uh, tyranny, uh, it radically enhanced Christian life in the West. That great movement we call the Renaissance only got started after Byzantine Eastern Christians, Eastern Orthodox Christians, who saw the fall of Constantinople, who saw their culture swallowed up by advancing Ottoman armies. When they brought Came, came to the West, when they came to Venice, when they came to Italy, bringing with them the great contents of the library at Alexandria, right? That, that ancient Greek library at Alexandria. All these Greek ancient books now were in the hands of European Renaissance scholars and it completely transformed culture. So, right, the, the idea that what was advancing was barbaric and backwards. Educationally, look at in terms of art. I mean, right, the, the Quranic uh, prohibitions against representational art, particularly of religious subjects, versus uh, medieval and Christian ability uh, to paint sacred truths and how one artistic culture flourished under a, a different understanding of God than the, and I have a, a mini theory about it. If you think about Christianity, Christianity, its fundamental uh, uh, idea of Christianity is the Trinity in many respects. You've got one God who is three, three gods, who three radical individuals who are one. There is already a kind of tolerance for diversity and an interactive nature about the Christian Trinity. You think about the radical oneness of Allah, right? There can be no God but Allah. It's interesting, you wonder uh, sort of sociologically and theologically as the, the conceptual ideas of Islam and Christianity evolved, one seems much more prevalent to one world thinking, to one way only, uh, to absolute intolerance uh, for different kinds of religions or different kinds of people. I mean, today, no one seems to complain that you can't set foot in Saudi Arabia, certainly at the holy sites if you're Jewish. Uh, you can't build a church anywhere in, in Saudi Arabia. Yet we're happy in the West to welcome peaceful Muslims here and let them build mosques, worship the way they want. Uh, there's some, I think there's something in the historical and anthropological origins of the founding ideas of the two religions that one suggests uh, uh, relative openness, relative willingness to embrace uh, alternative kinds of thinkings that have led to pr uh, incredible growths and wealth and economic opportunity versus a system that in many ways is still a, an eighth century system uh, that is mired in a kind of universe, a one way of thinking uh, that thwarts this kind of diversity and interaction with other cultures. Well, of course, the history of Christianity has to some degree been the history of attempting to work with existing belief systems, prior belief systems, contemporary belief systems. If you look at, of course, the, the massive respect given to the non-Christian philosopher Aristotle throughout the late Middle uh, Ages period, he was called the philosopher, uh, and he was not considered uh, a heretic or a blasphemer and so on. And that's just one example, the fact that the Christianity was willing to work with Roman uh, ideas, Roman philosophy, and in particular Roman law, right, when the cities began to reemerge in the late Middle Ages as the result of, you know, there being better farming methods, excess food is required for cities, otherwise everyone's starving to death in a, their own 40 acres. And so when the cities began to regrow, the, the church turned to Roman law as a way of saying, let's not reinvent the wheel here. We had a great system of law that came, of course, from originally non-Christian sources and was developed um, in early Christianity, uh, well, developed before Christianity, but further developed in early Christianity. So there's this willingness to absorb and work with other belief systems. And of course, Christianity is not a political system. Uh, and people look at the theological aspects of Islam, which is fair, of course, the theological aspects to Islam, but it is a political system. Uh, as I've said before, it's sort of like looking at communism and saying, well, it's just an economic theory. It's like, nope, it's a political system. And that, of course, is the challenge. So let's talk a little bit about the tipping point for the first question of the Crusades, right? So there are Christian Byzantines um, who were in Constantinople, now Istanbul. Oh, that always gets that song in my head. But um, uh, uh, so uh, the, the Byzantines were being attacked by, by the Muslims. Uh, there was a second Muslim attack that was just barely repelled. And this, this battle between the Christian Byzantines and the Muslims went on for hundreds and hundreds of years, you know, successes and failures on both sides. 
and uh, the Byzantines were never able to recapture their territory. And they tried, of course, they were devout Christians, they tried to recapture Jerusalem, but were unable to, uh, to do so. And because Jerusalem is so important to the Christians, uh, the Byzantines were working hard to, to recover it from, uh, from Muslim rule for more than a century, and then the Crusades happened. So here we go, 1071, the Byzantines had uh, uh, suffered a crushing defeat under the Muslims. They lost a huge amount of their territory, and their emperor was captured. And so from 1073 to 1095, the Byzantines were begging members of the Western nobility and Christian leaders for military aid. And then what happened, 1095, ambassadors sent by the Byzantine emperor appeared before Pope Urban II and said, we need your help to deal with the Muslims. And it was later that year, this is almost 1100, almost the year 1100, the Pope said, maybe, maybe we should start looking at military solutions to these uh, expansionist uh, tendencies of Islam, and we should try and take back the key areas uh, of, uh, of Christian theology. Yes, and the one thing we haven't yet mentioned, that it's so obvious that the fact that nobody mentions it is why our kids have forgotten it. Jerusalem, the Palestine, it was not empty. I mean, this idea that somehow my kids actually believe that Islam always and forever had owned Jerusalem, right? That it was always a, a Jew, uh, an Islamic city. The idea that my kids seem to have is that one day at some mysterious vantage point, Islamic armies wandered into Jerusalem and found a completely abandoned city, and then they just inherited it, right? Uh, the, the, the story of the Crusades always begins with 1095, right? A Christian pope decides uh, to send an army to Jerusalem to try to take it back. But the back is the key. For, uh, for, for four or five hundred years, Islam had been advancing and conquering. They had taken these, they put, brutalized the inhabitants of Jerusalem when they took the city. That doesn't count as crusade, doesn't count as colonialism. It's only that pivotal moment in 1095 when, and it reminds me of today's circumstance, any attempt on the modern Western world to fight back or to even try to stem the, the tide of immigration from certain highly uh, politicized, radicalized nations, that's considered racist, right? So uh, it, it feeds, and you see how much worse it gets. If we treat our history this way, right, if we refuse to see the complex interactions of different kinds of people from our history, how in the world can we deal with today's problems? We can't. Our, in, in the same way that we're apologetic now for crusading Islamic armies and angry that Western armies, armies finally tried to answer them. You see what's happening in places like Germany and Sweden now, right? Where it's much better to allow your daughters to be raped. It's much better to keep your mouth shut and allow aid, state aid to be paid to um, terrorist people, to, uh, terrorist families. Much better to do that than to risk opening your mouth in defense of Western values, which we have taught people have no defense anymore. Right. So. The tipping point for the Crusades, let's just, yeah, as you point, point out, let's just give people a brief sort of takeaway. You've had over 400 years of Muslim aggression, uh, an invasion taking over of Christianity, Christian territories. Three out of the five Christian centers have fallen to Muslim hands. Rome has been attacked. Two of its holy sites have been desecrated. Constantinople, which is one of the last remaining capitals of Christianity, is facing down a Muslim threat, again, existential to its existence. So this idea that Christians just woke up one day and just decided, hey, let's just go charging off to the Middle East and start hacking people up, um, come on. I mean, this, this can't be, this can't be uh, considered to be true at all. I mean, the, the Christians stood for uh, or stood without a huge counterattack or a significant counterattack they uh, say accepted, they allowed for or they submitted to this expansionism for longer than slavery existed in America before uh, really coalescing and, and fighting back. And um, Jerusalem, of course, uh, the, the first crusade was the aim was to recapture Jerusalem, which was a Christian city. And they were simply trying to take back what culturally and theologically and historically had been Christian to begin with. And that is very, very tough for people to process. They also don't understand uh, when, when the Muslims uh, had uh, Muslim piracy, the Barbary pirates and so on, was a huge deal. One of the first things Thomas Jefferson had to do when he was president was deal with problems with Muslim piracy, North Africa, the Mediterranean, and so on. This is one of the reasons why, I mean, people, it's astonishing. Over a million Europeans were taken as slaves uh, by, by Muslims and other North Africans. The entire coastline 
around Europe was depopulated. People couldn't even fish. That the reason why there are castles that was because of these constant raids from Muslim slave traders. And um, again, this it doesn't exist in history, which is why history is now a strangulation fable designed to crush the larynx of Western cultural pride or self-respect or, or any appreciation for, his, for, for the positive effects of Western culture. It is a brain virus, and it's impossible for me to understand how what's taught uh, in, in the West, what's taught as history, how could it possibly different be different from, from the greatest enemies of the West to teaching that history? I mean, they always say, oh, the winners write the history. It's like, okay, so who's won and who's writing this history now? Because it sure as hell isn't the victors of the West. Yeah, it's a great point. And, you know, as somebody at the university level who sees the kind of history that's getting taught, it is acrimoniously incorrect about Western culture in general. You mentioned uh, the fall of Constantinople. Think about that for a second. All this demand today for reparations, how we have to make amends, just the West does, right, for what we've done. Uh, but the greatest, the, to, this, to this day, the greatest church, uh, the la largest church in human history, the Hagia Sophia, right, that great church in Constantinople, it's now the greatest mosque in the world, right, that they took this great building, this edifice of Byzantine Christianity, Islam conquered it, turned it into a mosque, and yet where are the, cause, the, the calls for reparations? If we, if we called for Islam to give back and repair, provide reparations for what it's taken, the toll on them would be so outrageously high as to dwarf uh, what American or Western responsibilities are. And yet this is something that we almost can't even talk about uh, because of the, the multi how dominant multiculturalism has become. Uh, one of the things I love about talking to you is your understanding that the argument wins, right? That reasoned logical analysis. I have no problem calling out, in fact, it's what makes Western culture special is that we have always, for a long time, even in those benighted years with the Catholic Church, there was still a lot of criticism of the church from within. Dante in the 13th century is putting popes in hell for goodness sake, right? Uh, 500 years, 400 years, 500 years before the Enlightenment, Dante, who by the way called Aristotle the master of the men who know, right? To go back to your earlier point about this appreciation for uh, even pre-Christian pagans. Uh, but the argument that somehow, some way, uh, Western culture has to bear the brunt of this. Uh, if you if you lay Western culture alongside all the other cultural uh, ways of thinking and doing and seeing and being, we come out looking really pretty good. Uh, and this argument somehow that we alone are the problem, it's the only argument that the progressives can make, the anarchists can make. It, the only way you can convince people, kids in particular, uh, that Western culture has to be replaced is to not show them the truth about non-Western cultures. Well, and I do want to make this point, which uh, I don't think can ever be made emphatically enough, that what is called multiculturalism is uh, anti-Europeanism, it's anti-white, it's anti-Western. Because if all cultures are supposed to be valuable, go to these classes and challenge people to say what is wonderful and valuable about European, white, Western, Christian culture. It is not multiculturalism. It is anti white, it is anti-Christian, it is anti-European. That's all it is. Everything else is elevated in order to lower and attack uh, this uh, culture that, that certainly you and I have uh, as our history. It's not multiculturalism because the, the white culture is not elevated the way that other cultures are, but other cultures are used as giant, giant clubs with which to smash the face in of thousands of years of Western history and Western culture. I, I don't think that it can ever be expressed strongly enough. It's not diversity, it's anti-white. It's not multiculturalism, it's anti-European uh, traditions, it's anti-Christianity. Take it one step further. I'm always alarmed at the incredible racism of the term white male, right? So Aristotle and Dostoevsky. And sexism. Exactly. Aristotle and Dostoevsky, uh, Kafka and Frederick Barbarossa. These are all the same people, right? It doesn't matter if it's 2,000 years ago or two days ago. Any European, any American, any North American combination of, of ethnicities. and it, It's just so bizarre. Uh, the, the, the radical diversity that we already see within Western culture is a thing to behold. There's, a lot, there's not much diversity in the great Chinese emperors, right? There was not a whole lot of diversity in, in uh, uh, North America prior to the arrival of the Europeans, but within European culture itself, we've inherited Judaism, the, the whole Jewish tradition, we've inherited uh, the whole uh, classical tradition 
I mean, the different people from different parts, from Russia to South, from, to Russia to North America, you've got all this incredible plenipotential diversity. You've got all of these different groups contributing. And that's, a, that's all seen as a monolith. Whereas the real monolithic nations of the world, some of the most fascist ones, they're given a complete pass on all of this. It goes back to what you said before. And I remember in a previous conversation down the road we did, um, is there ever been a culture, has there ever been a culture in the history of the world, I, we asked this question rhetorically, that has been so self-loathing as this one. And how did we get here? How did we get to the point where to be proud, uh, they're trying to, on college campuses, they're trying to ban the flag on 4th of July. Thanksgiving has to be done away with because it's an insult to Native Americans. I mean, uh, where did we get to the point where this kind of cultural rot, I think Lincoln was right. If America goes down, it's not going to be from enemies without it will be because of our own moral turpitude, our own unwillingness to defend our way of life. And that's exactly where we find ourselves now. I don't see a lot of people criticizing the lack of diversity in Saudi Arabia uh, or other countries. I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's crazy. I mean, Europe is, is crazy diverse uh, compared to, to the Middle East. So uh, as far as where it went, my sort of very, very brief theory, which is still a work in, pro in, in progress and may, of course, not be the final answer, is that when you have freedom... Uh, and I just did a video on the uh, Pareto distribution, right, which is uh, that a small, in a large group of uh, involved in the free market, a very small number produce significant amounts of, uh, of wealth. So if you have a company of 10,000 people, only 100 people within those 10,000 produce half the output. So when you have freedom in a creative environment, you end up with disparity. You end up with inequality, so to speak, of outcome because, you know, the bell curve and, and IQ distribution and, and other things as well. And so when you have freedom, you get, you get a, a small number of very rich people, you get a big chunk of the middle class, and then you get poor people. And when you have that kind of inequality, it opens up a big hole in the side of your culture for people to worm in and say, oh, those rich people, they're only rich because they stole from you. And, and to, to arouse and rouse up the resentments of the poor people, of the less intelligent people on the bell curve. And from that, you can start to set the rot in. And until and unless we understand this Pareto distribution, the bell curve in terms of IQ, uh, it, it's forever going to be an open wound that can fester because freedom does produce inequality. And then when you get inequality, you get all of the class baiters who come in and tell all the poor people to hate the rich people, and then you tax the rich people, which destroys your productivity from within. So this is just fundamental things we need to, I don't know if we're going to be able to turn it around this time, but it'd be great to remember it for next time. <laughs> Well, and the flip side of that coin is, is that what allows authoritarian states, and I would argue that Islam generally is, an, it, it's a religion elevated to a government uh, and turned into a kind of dictatorship, at least the way it's practiced in most parts of the world. Well, but the word does mean submission. It does, There's doesn't a bit it, of a clue right? there. And so the flip side of that coin is, is that not only are the lower, the, the burgeoning lower classes much more free to rise up, but you've lost the will to authority in, the, in, in Western culture. When why stand by and watch on college campuses as our most sacred right, freedom of speech, is being absolutely bullied into submission by college kids and police officers standing there afraid to intervene. Uh, so authoritarian countries, non-Western authoritarian countries, they control the problem of lower classes grumbling with an iron fist. It's a mark of our relative civility. And this goes back a thousand years Pr prior to Magna Carta. This goes back, right? It's a mark of our relative tolerance in the West that we are, our first recourse isn't always the authoritarian one. Again, you couldn't have had things like Magna Carta. You couldn't have had uh, a ri the rise of a middle class if we were so authoritarianly structured as some of these non-Western cultures are that there's no or the untouchables in India where there's never even the slightest pretense that anybody could rise higher than their station. Right. Now, I do want to drop something in here as well uh, and get, get your thoughts on it before we move on to the history of, of, of slavery in the Middle East. And, and it is this. I have noticed that as the ruling classes in the West have become relentlessly secular, I, mean, I think they play, they pay a lip service to vague Christian ideals, but they have become enormously uh, secular. I mean, if you think of the Reverend Jeremiah Wright, who was, you know, screaming his squadron of, of anti-American uh, invective at his supposedly Christian audience, I mean, that's a political speech. And, and it's more, it's become heavily politicized, even the lip service that is paid to Christianity. But in the past, you know, as far as Western colonial, colonialism goes, there was considered to be, and it used to be called this, the white man's burden, which was, look, we have civilization, we have relative free markets, we have a great culture, we have Christianity and so on. 
And when we go to sub-Saharan Africa, people don't really remember this because, again, there's this revisionism going on, I think, far beyond what the, what the data supports, which is you, you get to sub-Saharan Africa when, when the first Europeans got there. And yeah, there was brutality, there was slave trading, cannibalism in certain places. In sub-Saharan Africa, there was no two-story buildings. This is in the sort of 15th, 16th, 17th century. No written language. They hadn't invented the wheel yet. And there was this idea of, you know, there but for the grace of God are us. So there was this idea of the white man's burden that we're going to try and bring civilization to a stable government. Uh, we're going to ban cannibalism and, and we're going to ban, I mean, the Sooty in, in India, you pointed out one of the things, the bride had to throw herself on the funeral pyre of her husband and burn to death. And then this idea that, you know, we kind of, by the grace of God or philosophy or luck or whatever, we developed some pretty cool stuff. We want to bring it to the rest of the world and try and bring everyone up to our level. Well, that was, you know, and there was corruption in it, and I understand all of that, but there was a benevolence foundationally for a lot of this stuff, which also drove the end uh, of the slave trade uh, in, in the West uh, and around the world. But as leaders in the West have become progressively more secular, this, it's not like the imperialism has ended. I mean, as I've pointed out on the show, under Barack Obama's presidency, he dropped 100,000 bombs, largely on Muslim countries. That's not how colonialism used to, work, used to work. Colonialism, whatever misguided and however corrupt sometimes its outcome was, it wasn't just sh uh, the British Navy's ships sitting in the harbor and firing randomly into cities. It wasn't just throwing cannonballs down the main streets of a city somewhere in the third world. There was an attempt to go in and, and fix things that were really broken uh, in, in those societies. So as the sort of Christian impulse to, to civilize and to bring not just uh, Jesus, but to bring separation of church and state and, and the free market and representative democracies and a republic, if you can milk one out of the local conditions, now it's like the CIA doing coups. It's a, the undermining of foreign democracy. It's propaganda machines. It's, it's really gruesome manipulations. It's massive amounts of bombing but all of these people hate Christianity as well. And it's like what the colonialism that occurred under Christianity had a benevolence that's hard to imagine. I mean, you, again, just think, you can't just look at the Amritsar massacre and other things that happened and say, well, these bad things happen. Well, sure, that's like looking at, at the night sky and saying it's, it's daylight because there are stars. I mean, it's the gap between, not the things themselves that matter. Would you rather live in sub-Saharan Africa before the British came along or after. Just look at life expectancy, uh, look at uh, birth rates, look at infant mortality. Uh, these things all got vastly better under colonial rule. And so it seems to me that since human beings do have some impulse for colonialism, we all want to spread and grow and so on, it sure was better when Christianity, rather than this secular leftism, which seems to me corrupt, if not satanic, almost beyond words, now the, the bombings that are going on in the Middle East have no civilizing impact. Civilizing impacts are sold like, oh, we're going to be welcomed as liberators in Iraq, and we're going to make a Jeffersonian democracy out of, out of this, this society. But it has become much more brutal with no redeeming outcomes, as was the case with Christian-driven imperialism. And that, to me, is something that needs to be remembered as well. There is a lot of violence going on from the secular rulers in the West towards the Muslims in the Middle East and, and other places. This bomb everyone and invite everyone is a terribly catastrophic scenario. But it seems to be getting a lot worse uh, since the rulers became more secular. Sorry for that long speech. I hope that makes some kind of sense. No, but, it does. Uh, and I, and I have a couple, a couple of thoughts uh, on my side of this is, number one, I think that you asked the question, as they become more secular, as Christianity becomes went to becoming nothing more than a cultural product, not a theological one or a philosophical one, now to being nothing. Uh, religion in general, but particularly Christianity in the West, it gave a transcendent reason to have a worldview. It, it provided an identity. It, it anchored truth in something beyond materialism, something beyond mere existence. Uh, and so I think pe the people who argue that uh, all bad things are done in the name of war, they never, in the name of religion, all bad things are done in the name of religion, all wars and all this stuff, but they never point out the opposite side of that, the positive impact of religion or the idea of religion uh, in human in human affairs, human politics, government, this the white man's burden, as you say, this tendency. Uh, we, uh, despite the bad things that that were part of the Western colonial legacy, look at 
the results. I mean, India is a better place than it was before. Look at South Korea. I mean, just look at the difference between South Korea and North Korea and the impact of Western values, Western importation, Western defense of South Korea versus what happened in North Korea. Uh, one peninsula, light, night and day differences. Uh, and some of this, I think, does. A culture that no longer believes it has any transcendent meaning, a culture that, ne no, that no longer believes that intervention in the affairs of people can be a positive, not just a negative. Culture like that, I think, can't survive, it becomes totally self-loathing. And the opposite side of the coin to um, all of this cultural attempt to better, to wasn't it, bringing orphanage, uh, the idea of Mother Teresa, you know, working away in India, uh, trying to take care of those people that no that the Indians really didn't care about, right? These untouchables again. Uh, now, in, in progressive circles, Mother Teresa is viewed as an interloper, right? She's a, a kind of a quasi-colonialist who's imposing her will on, imposing her religion on innocent non-Westerners. That's the progressive rewrite of Mother Teresa. And so if you look at the flip side of the coin of that particular rationale, you get cultural appropriation. This idea now that whenever whenever white people do yoga, they're disrespecting <laughs> uh, Hinduism. Whenever white people, how about that? A couple of weeks ago on a college campus, where a group of young minority girls were demanding that uh, white girls stop wearing hoop earrings. Literally, they were calling for the. That's a a, a a heritage of our slave days. These hoop earrings, they said, go back to the slave times in America. And of course, immediately the history, real history, debunked it. Uh, hoop earrings go all the way back to the Egyptians. They're not the pro, the the uh, the sole. Um, ownership of African-American slaves in the 19th century, but this idea that it only goes one way, right? That whenever Europeans, Christians, conservatives, Westerners uh, show their appreciation for other cultures by trying to borrow from them, now that's racist. And I, I, you know, my, all my family's Italian. Can you imagine me walking into a pizza place and slapping the pizza out of a couple of Hispanic kids' hands and say, quit appropriating my culture? It's, it's, the, the cultural appropriation is the exact opposite corollary of what you just laid out about the benefits that Western culture could add, could in the past, when we believed in ourselves, all right, just despite the bad things we did, we could offer the world useful, meaningful, holistic things. Now we don't believe it anymore. So much so that for us to even uh, engage in uh, or share with West non-Western cultures makes us cultural appropriators. Got to stop doing that, but you can't turn around then and say to the rest of the world, this is the unfairness of it. If we said to the rest of the world, the West, all right, We'll stop appropriating any aspect of non-Western culture. We will no longer serve Indian food. We will no longer, nothing, nothing non-Western in our society to make you happy. On the provision that all the non-Western world must immediately jettison the culture they appropriated from us. No electronics, no computers, no satellites, no modern medicine, right? You're willing to, to because you're doing the same thing you accuse us of doing, right? But nobody ever lays it out in those terms. Oh, yeah. Can, can you imagine going to an Indian restaurant and saying, what's all this electricity you're using? That's cultural appropriation. You'd be racist for that, too. So, yeah, this I mean, the racism thing has become nonsense. So so let's talk about this this slave trade, because um, that was an important thing as well regarding um, the, the Crusades. Uh, as, as I mentioned before, over a million Europeans, uh, particularly those in coastal cities, snagged up by the Muslim slave trade. Uh, it, was, it was brutal, a brutal uh, system, and again, was depopulating the sort of outer rings uh, of Europe. I mean, Europe has traditionally had a very strong relationship with the sea, uh, but not uh, during this particular uh, time period. But the, um, the, the Muslim dominance of the slave trade, I mean, there was Jewish elements and there were Muslim elements that dominated the slave trade, in particular Islam between the 7th and the 15th century. Now, the Christians did enter the slave trade uh, later, 1519 to 1815, the period of Christian uh, slave trading, much shorter and much more humane than what happened uh, in the Islamic slave trade. 14 centuries of Muslim slave trade. The death toll in Africa alone is estimated at over 112 million people, 112 million blacks from Africa killed by the Muslim slave trade. Um, and this is a staggering sum because, of course, you normalize it for world population now. It would be one of the biggest death tolls of anything throughout history, far bigger even normalized for human population than the 100 million or so killed by communism in the uh, 20th century. It is one of the greatest mass murders, mass enslavements in, in history, if not the greatest. And that this, this also happened to Christians, right? The kidnapping Christians to be sold as slaves goes all the way back to the 7th century under uh, Islam. I got a quote from a historian who said, it was the perpetual raiding of Muslim pirates and slave traders that brought about the abandonment throughout Southern Europe of the scattered settlements of 
of classical times and the retreat to defended hilltop fortifications, the first medieval castles. The same raiding led to the abandonment of the old agricultural systems with their irrigation dikes and ditches. So some of the mass starvations that happened uh, as a result uh, of uh, poor farming methods had to do because you couldn't be scattered, you couldn't take, because you'd be out exposed uh, and, and without a fortification. So you'd just be snagged and sold into slavery. The Muslim slave trade was, uh, the, the Muslim slave trade typically dealt with um, castrated male slaves, right, eunuchs. And you would completely amputate the scrotum and penis of eight to 12 year old African boys. And of course, significant numbers of them died uh, in agony during this particular process. And so this is really, really important to understand that it was an incredibly brutal slave trade, far dwarfed anything that happened in Christianity is unexamined, unapologized for, certainly no restitution has ever been offered from a very rich Middle East to a relatively poor Africa in the centuries since. And it's not spoken about because the only people responsible for any slavery are the people who ended the practice. And if you take slavery and define it the way modern progressives do, you could make the, you would have to make the argument that not only was Islam the greatest slave trading institution in the history of the world, you, could, you would have to make the argument that the, almost the entirety of womanhood in Islamic countries are slaves as well. You mentioned the creating of the eunuchs to guard the harems, right? Well, what is this genital genital mutilation stuff that's going on in American hospitals now? Let that sink in. You've got American hospitals now that are performing genital mutilations on on Islamic girls because culturally their fathers want them to. That's slavery too. Let's turn this back on the liberals. The progressive definition of slavery means exactly that. Uh, Not only did Islam uh, was the most successful at enslaving people across the world that weren't Muslims, they are the best enslavers of their own people as well. By the definition of progressives, they are. So playing the progressive game, you got to apply the standard rationally, right? If all these things count as slavery, then what they do to many of their own people count as well. And so how do you how do you apologize for this? You remember the fellow, the guy who played Gimli, John Rhys Davies, I think his name was, something like that, who played Gimli the dwarf, a famous actor in The Lord of the Rings. He was a little boy. His father was an African diplomat. He tells the story in like 1947 when he was a little kid. His father took him to a dock in Africa and pointed out to three ships that were leaving the coast of Africa heading east. He said, "Uh, those ships are slave ships, he said, son. Those ships are Islamic trade, slave trade ships that are taking African people back to the Middle East to become slaves. He said to him, someday, someday your generation is going to have to fight those. You're going, that, that's the next big problem we're going to have to confront. He tells the story very poignantly, right, as a young boy. Um, and so, yeah, so if we're going to, if we're going to uh, use the radically expanded definition of slavery as promulgated to beat up Western culture, right, they're, they're telling us now what, if you make under a certain income, you're a slave. You got multimillionaire players in the NFL, right, arguing that they're slaves to these, these owners who have all this billion of dollars. We're going to radically expand these definitions that it's awfully hard not to just condemn Islam externally, but condemn it internally as well, as uh, uh, the entire social structure is predicated on that kind of slavery. And let's also remember Eastern Europe. Uh, Of course, Eastern Europe receiving criticism from leftist quarters because of a lack of willingness to take in uh, migrants. Well, I guess they still have a little bit more objective history uh, in Eastern Europe and some of that sort of region. Um, So Crimean Tatars enslaved and sold 1.75 1.75 million Ukrainians, Poles, and Russians between 1468 and 1694. Uh, and I've got a whole truth about slavery, which people can check out if they want. So 1.75, again, normalize that by population. It's got to be 10 to 20 times that amount relative to current population. And I, I tell you, oh man. So Dr. Pester, one of the things that bothers me is that um, I, I don't consider anybody who lifts a feather Uh, and claims himself to be a strong man to have any particular credibility. Whites are pathologically self-critical these days. They're like abuse victims, you know, in in brutal relationships, which, you know, I think whites are in pretty brutal relationship to to the dominant culture at the moment. It's a very leftist Marxist uh, culture. And to get... To, to yell at white people and say, feel bad for something, or you did this stuff wrong in history and feel bad for it. Well, white people are already flagellating themselves like psychotic medieval monks in many, in many ways. And so 
getting morally outraged at people who are already self-victimizing is not a very challenging moral feat. The challenging moral feat is to bring your moral outrage to people who aren't even willing to admit that anything wrong happened. That is where the real challenge exists there and occurs. There are very few of our feminist professors willing to go to Iran and educate the girls there. A little of that, right? Right. And so this uh, has become a... Uh, I view most of the, quote, moralists in the West these days and maybe elsewhere as well, I don't view them as moralists. I view them as bullies. I view them as, as picking the most self-critical, um, most spiritually weakened people and yelling at them and calling them bad. Uh, and that, of course, is what happens in abusive relationships. The man breaks down the wife and then castigates her and criticizes her and slams her cooking and slams her sexual prowess and breaks her down even more. That is not courageous criticism of a fellow human being. That's just finding somebody who's already self-attacking, pouring fuel on the uh, on the fire uh, and then considering yourself some sort of moral hero. I really, really despise the people who are spending their time and effort criticizing a lack of diversity in the West or criticizing racism or sexism in the West. It's like, come on, there's a whole world out there where you could show your moral heroism and your moral strength and your moral principles and so on by going out and yeah, talk, go, go talk to the, um, the caliphates uh, out there in the Middle East about the history of the slave trade and go start demanding reparations and go start demanding apologies and go start demanding all of that. I want to see how that's going to go. I wonder if, if you can go and say, hey, Saudi Arabia, you really should allow some, some Christian churches to be open because you're really not recognizing and respecting diversity and so on. They don't want to go and do that. And that, to me, means that they have no interest in the good. They only have interest in a kind of sadistic abuse of self, the self-haters. Well, picking on, like you said, picking on, uh, for lack of a better word, white American culture, you're also bravely... Uh, picking on the one demographic that you know is not going to fight back, right? It is the least threatening to call out uh, white power in this country, to make fun of Christian institutions, Western culture, uh, to traduce the canon of literature. Uh, that, that, no one's going to fight you back. I mean, you're it's a straw man argument. You're fighting the most unresponsive people in the world. That's part of the problem. Uh, the Chinese, I mean, the Chinese kill more of their people every year than all the rest of the countries of the world combined, right? The idea, this goes beyond Islam, right? Uh, the, 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 the one country on this earth that the Lao guy that actually has a dedicated gulag is China. And yet we've completely mainstreamed them in terms of uh, uh, business prowess, in terms of a uh, seat on the Security Council. Yeah, so where are these brave Westerners who can picket Ann Coulter, for God's sake, at, at Berkeley to the point of, of causing millions of dollars of property damage and, and engaging in all sorts of acts of violent disobedience? Where are they when it comes to what happens in China? Where is the progressive left? Talk about uh, Muslim atrocities. Now, the progressive left that is very concerned about genocide could care less about the Armenian genocide. You've got uh, high-weight Democrat uh, politicians who are denying the, the, the genocide of the Armenians by the Turks simply because it's fashionably unmulticultural to do so. And we talked already about how every offense uh, by the Jews in Israel is magnified and what they're surrounded by every day is largely minimalized, right? We've seen the, uh, uh, the human hostages. We've seen the fake video. We've seen Palestinians as young as three and four, right, uh, in, in, in military gear, throwing stones at police officers. And there's no, th this moral equivalence, right, between the two sides is exactly what the problem is. And it's until we as, until the West decides, and I, I go back to what you said a little while ago, I, I'm not sure you can reverse this now. Uh, because we're turning out more and more generations of kids who are more and more being taught this every year. So as bad as you and I had it, and as bad as our kids are getting it, imagine what our grandkids are beginning to get, right, in the elementary, middle, and high school. So um, the only way you win this, and the founding, uh, the founding fathers were right, the republic will stand as long as you have two things, an educated and a moral population, right? We can talk about the morality aspect perhaps another time, but certainly as far as education goes, I think our entire chat today suggests there are horrific dangers the kind of miseducation, the kind of anti-education that we're given our kids about our own country and our own way of life. Uh, it won't stand. If we cannot convince our kids that freedom is better than slavery, uh, that free speech is better than censorship, if we don't have the guts to show our kids America, Western culture's demerits alongside the demerits of the rest of the world, then you could make a solid argument that we don't deserve our own civilization. 
Well, I, um, I certainly think and hope that our conversations can help to uh, generate that kind of uh, courage in people. You know, the, we're like a sandcastle and, and time is like the waves. You know, we have to defend, we have to rebuild, we have to protect because everything falls apart, everything falls away that is not rigorously protected and defended. Your freedoms will wash away, your independence will wash away, your liberties, your egalitarianism fantasies will all wash away uh, if you don't actually protect and defend what you have. And uh, everybody in the world wants uh, what everyone else has. And there has been, I think, particularly in higher education, and you would speak to this much better than I could, Dr. Pester, but I think there has been in higher education a pretty relentless dumbing down. It goes back to what Harold Bloom was talking about decades ago. But as the gates of academia have opened up to allow more and more people in the fantasy, you say, oh, well, you know, people who have a college degree are really, really smart and they make a lot of money. So let's have everyone get a college degree so they can become really, really smart and make a lot of money. It's like, that's not, no, no. <laughs> No, no, that's not how it works. Smart people go to college. College doesn't make people necessarily smart. You know, tall people get on the basketball team. Putting a short person on the basketball team doesn't make them tall. And what's happened is, and I just read this the other day, that over the past couple of decades, the average mean IQ of college students has gone down by almost a full standard deviation. So you've opened up the gates, you've opened up. And then what happens is you have a lot of people in there who don't have the native intellectual acuity to understand principles beyond the immediate. And if you don't understand principles, i.e. freedom breeds inequality of incomes and outcomes, then you are so prone to what uh, Nietzsche called resentment, right? He used the French word ressentiment all the time. But this idea of resentment that you can take, you can always find people and, and show them others who are doing better than they are, right? This has happened uh, with the, um, the kulaks in, in um, uh, post-revolutionary Soviet Russia, right, after 1917. They went to all of the peasants, and some of the peasants were doing really well. Again, it's that Pareto distribution, right? Out of 10,000 peasants, it's 100 who produce half the food. And you go to all of the lazy, drunken, idiot, or just not particularly smart peasants, and you say, ah, those peasants, they got all their food, they got all their land, they got all their wealth, they got their pretty women and pretty wives, and they've stolen it from you, and we're going to steal it back from you. Because they're just bad people and they're pillaging and they're, they, because, you know, predator distribution is like the antithesis to um, the egalitarian fantasies. And so you've got all of these people coming into college uh, who aren't doing as well as smart people, who cannot replicate the successes of prior generations of uh, intellectuals. And what's everyone saying? Well, they're saying, well... See, all those people, uh, they just stole everything. They're just bad, and you're exactly equal to them. But the reason you can't do as well is because of privilege and racism and sexism and glass ceilings and you name it. All of these magical inventions to explain underperformance that can very easily be explained statistically with the bell curve and so on. And I think this is a great uh, challenge to our society, which is why I think some of the most interesting intellectual work these days is being done outside of academia because the flood yeah. of less able students into academia, I don't think it's designed to share the wealth. I think it's actually designed to destroy academia. Yeah, and if, if our kids today are one standard deviation intelligence-wise less than their predecessors, our kids are three or four or five standard deviations less in their cultural knowledge, right? One way, I think, to raise the intellectual achievement is to go back to teaching real cultural knowledge to kids, right? By exposing kids to comparative societies. We don't do it anymore. We don't have real critical thinking in the schools anymore because the narrative is all political. It's not educational. The politics dictate we must magnify the of the West and ignore the non-Western sins to, to combat racism. But that's counter-intellectual. It's, it's quasi-fascist in a way. It's lying to our kids. If we went back to comparative critical analysis, right? Okay, here are the bad things, America. Here's what the Western, what Western culture did wrong in the, in the Crusades. Here are some of the atrocities. Here are some of the motivations. Here are some of the petty behaviors because there were plenty. Whenever you get people together, you get plenty. Here are plenty. But on the other side of the coin, now consider the opponent in the Crusades, right? Five centuries, four centuries before the first crusade. This was happening, this was happening, this was happening. What would you, and, and get kids to engage that way? Uh, that I think is gonna raise the overall profile, but our universities won't do it. They are adamantly committed to going down that other path, to transforming the United States of America, to transforming the West, uh, not on the basis of truth or knowledge, understanding, learning, or critical thinking, but simply by 
for lack of a better word, uh, incorporating this kind of cheap quasi-socialist dialectic to uh, get us to be so uh, embarrassed about ourselves that our fundamental institutions are transformed. The very things, the very pillars on which we built Western freedom, free speech, free association, free expression, uh, free markets, uh, free expression of religion, all that has to be done away with. And I, I, there's a small percentage of our intellectual elite who understand exactly what that means in terms of uh, the destruction of a way of life, the, uh, the, for by, by and large, the end of liberty in the world. Where else are you going to go when the West falls? Uh, there's a small percentage that understand that. But far, far too many of our, even our professors, haven't thought through carefully enough what their own, pl their own little uh, uh, challenged platforms to speak truth, how as soon as they get rid of the other stuff, that's going to go too. That the little island on which they think they are immune in their progressivism, that's going to be swallowed up just as quickly as everything else is. Uh, that's the, the tragedy in this, that the people screaming about this, these college kids screaming about democracy uh, in doing in demo, anti-democratic protests, demanding their free speech rights while shutting down the speech of others, insisting upon no fascism and no violence while brutalizing people who disagree with them, don't have enough intellectual awareness or simple common sense to understand that the shoe is on the other foot as well and that you're inviting those things back at you. This is uh, the great, I think, coming horror that I think men and women of good conscience are trying desperately to avert is that uh, young people, I think, are not being taught how to think anymore. They're being taught how to hate. And you get a certain rush, a certain sadistic rush when you uncork your hatreds and your frustrations. And you've been told by the powers that be that those particular people are your enemy. And generally, whoever's saying those people are your enemy who doesn't have a good rational basis, just follow the arm back up to the head that's saying it. That's probably your actual enemy. But they're not being taught how to think. They're being taught how to hate. And that gives you a certain amount of power until the objects of your hatred begin to hate back. And I think that's starting to happen now when you look at the pushback with the free speech uh, riots and so on. Well, people are showing up now and they're willing to fight back. And that, I think, is where the civility of society really hangs in the balance. And that takes us all the way back as a nice segue as we wind down to the Crusades. In reality, the Crusades were not some spur-of-the-moment attempt by Western peoples to dominate and punish non-Western peoples. It was a response to a civilization that was under attack, their civilization, their worldview, their beliefs, their religion was being assaulted by an aggressive, powerful enemy. And after centuries of that kind of oppression, they fought back. And we're all better because they did. Western culture is better because they did, and world culture is better because they did. We are in a similar situation. If we are not willing to fight back, at primarily intellectually, philosophically, right? Uh, but sooner or later, as we're beginning to see, as, they become, as that side becomes more violent, right? Uh, we, if we're not willing to stand up to them and not be cowed by their violence, uh, then we're going to lose this again, right? And what I'm worried about vis-a-vis -vis our talk on the Crusades, we have turned crusading into, like, like the word discrimination, we have turned it into only a negative word. I tell my students all the time, kids, you discriminate all the time, and you have to. Do you want me to pick your husband for you? Would you be okay with that? No, you're too discriminating for that, right? You don't just stick anything in your mouth. You eat carefully. You discriminate. What about your friends? Do you pick your friends simply by who's first come, first serve? No. We've turned discrimination into one of those words, uh, which is a very useful word, we, but we've only given it its negative connotation. A crusade, the way the, the, the early, uh, the Middle Ages perceived the word crusade, it was a just battle for something worth saving. For survival. And it went for survival. We've completely lost that definition. And as long as we continue to do this with words, as long as we continue to teach kids that the, that the worst interpretation of a word is the only interpretation when it comes to our values, we're going to be behind the eight ball here. And, and so fighting back a lot of different ways, I'd prefer to fight back philosophically. I'd prefer to fight back theologically, intellectually. Uh, but at some point, they leave you no wiggle room. Are we a culture? And vis-a-vis -vis the immigrants, too, that are streaming into our countries. Are we a culture? that's willing to fight for our core values, whatever that means? Or are we going to roll over and let them go away? It is my hope that we can uh, continue with language, with reason, and with evidence, because uh, if it comes to a time when we can't, uh, and I have to step aside, whoever takes my place will be a very, very different kind of person. So thanks very much for the conversation. Just wanted to remind people to go to FPEUSA.com 
Org to check out the Freedom Project Academy. Uh, my great thanks to you as always, Dr. Pesta, not just for what you do on this show, which gets out to millions of people, but also for what you do in your classroom. I have uh, recommended that people stay away from uh, arts education, higher education, because it's like paying a lot of money to be indoctrinated and soul-destroying nonsense, except for the few shining lights in academia. So if you can get through to Dr. Pesta's classroom, I'm sure you're in for a great, wonderful, and uh, edifying ride. So thanks so much for your time. As always, I'm sure we'll talk again soon. Have yourself a great day, my friend. Thank you. Hope to see you soon.